Hello again everybody, I'm Robert Breaker and I'm coming to you today from the office. A lot of people said I can't wait to have Brother Breaker back in the office with the whiteboard. So here we are today with the whiteboard and I really wanted to be outside to do this sermon. Really bad. But it rained all day today so I wasn't able to get out and do this. This is actually going to be kind of part three to some messages we've been going through and uh, this will finish up that series that I was doing because there were three just logical questions that need to be asked, especially with everything we see going on in the world today. The first question, and this is part one in our series, was who's to blame? A lot of people are out pointing fingers nowadays, going, man, look at all the awful in the world. What's his fault? No, it's his fault. No, it's his fault. And they're blaming everyone. So who really should we blame, according to the Bible? Then we did last week, who's in charge? I mean, who's running this mess? <laughs> Because they're not doing that great a job in the eyes of a lot of people, and maybe they need to be replaced or something. I, just Who's running this thing? So we looked at that. Well, the next logical question is, who benefits from what's happening? Who is the one that's getting richer from the bad things that are happening? Maybe there's something to that. Maybe that's the bad guy? <laughs> I'm just, I just want to throw this out there and I want to give you scripture. And I want to look at today, qui bono. Now, qui bono is Latin and it means who benefits. Qui bono, who benefits. Now, I am not a detective, but I kind of always wanted to be a, a police detective. Now, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a firefighter. And then as I got older, I wanted to be a helicopter or an airplane pilot. That never worked out too well for me. But I always thought, man, wouldn't it be cool to be a police detective? And you base your case upon motive. Who had the motive for this crime and who would benefit the most from doing such and such a crime? Qui bono? Who would benefit? And that's how a detective approaches that. When I was a kid, we used to watch Perry Mason all the time. And uh, my grandparents would watch Columbo. My wife and I, for a while there, we'd watch all the CSIs. And we got to the point where we could solve it before it even ended. I'd say, honey, look, it was this guy. And you know, probably 80% of the time, it was the first character they introduced in the story. That was the guy that ended up being the bad guy. So that was the easy one to solve. But there was other times, like out in left field, you didn't see it coming. Like uh, this person wasn't the guilty one, but she was a triplet. Now, a twin, oh, that would have been like, whoa, but it was a triplet. And one of the triplets was one that did the crime. It was, sometimes they'll throw you some curveballs, so you can't always figure it out. But the best way to try to figure out the world and figure out what's happening and figure out why it's happening is to get that mindset of an investigative detective and ask the question, qui bono, who benefits? And who has a motive for wanting to mess everything up and destroy everything and things like that? So let's get started today in Jeremiah chapter 12 as we ask this question, qui bono? Who is benefiting? It also means um, who prospers. There are a lot of people out there that are prospering off of the misery and problems of others. And that is very sad. As a Christian, that hurts me. I want to see people prosper. I don't want to see others prosper off of the back of others. And to me, that's just a sad thing. I want everyone to prosper. But let's go to Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 1, because what we're seeing in the world today, and it's nothing new, it's nothing new, it's been around since the beginning of time, what we're seeing today is the wicked prosper while the righteous suffer. Now if you get a chance sometime, read the book of Job. You know what the book of Job is about? The book of Job is about the righteous suffering. And that's the whole question of the book of Job, is why do the righteous have to suffer? Why do the wicked seem to do bad and get away with it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, why? Well, because that's the fallen state or the fallen world we live in. And a lot of times, evil people prosper. But they won't prosper forever. They will eventually pay. You know, what goes around comes around. Instant karma is going to get you, if you will. But it's not karma, it's Jesus. And he is the judge, and he will judge all men someday for the evil and the good that they have done. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1. Jeremiah 12, 1, Jeremiah asked this question. And Jeremiah, by the way, was seeing the downfall of his nation in his day. And he saw the downfall of Israel. And then they were led into captivity because of their sin. Sometimes I feel like a modern-day Jeremiah. I'm watching my country go down the tubes, and I know where they're going to end up. Same place Israel did when God's judgment fell upon them. 
But in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Righteous are thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee. Yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Why are the wicked benefiting from all that's going on? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? Why are those that are guilty of treachery? Why are they prospering so much and we're suffering so much? Excellent question, Jeremiah. Why do the righteous suffer while the wicked prosper? Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I think I have it figured out. And uh, I want you to have it figured out because I want you to know the way that the world works. And then I want you to understand that you don't need anything this world has to offer. All you need is Jesus because Jesus is going to fix it all. And he's the only one who can. Everything down here is not important as much as Jesus is. Now, you got to eat, you got to have a job, you got to make money, you got to have a house to live in, you need a vehicle to go to work. I mean, I understand that. But you shouldn't lust after those things. You shouldn't desire that more than God. You shouldn't want prosperity more than you want Jesus. Okay? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 tell us perfectly the whole matter. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 says. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Now verse 10, which by the way has been changed in new versions of the Bible, that's why I do not use a new version of the Bible, I stick with the King James, because it tells you exactly what it says, and it's, it's true. New versions pervert it. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, new versions say it's the root of all kinds of evil. Are there different kinds of evil? What, what? No, there's good and there's evil. Okay? So why would they change that? The Bible is so plain and so simple that the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So the love of money is the root of all evil evil. So you want to know where evil comes from? You want to know why there's so much evil in the world? You want to know why there's such a mess and where that mess is coming from? Let's get to the root of the matter. The root is the love of money. And the love of money, that is lust. So that in and of itself is a sin. You're lusting after money. That's a sin. But in order to get more, now you're going to do more sins. You know what you'll do? You'll probably cut corners. You'll probably most likely be willing to do whatever it takes to make more money. And by so doing, you'll be willing to cheat and lie and steal and deceive. And that's some of the greatest sins, and that's what people do. People want money, fame, and power. And they are willing to do evil to get it. And we see that in the world today. We see people willing to do evil things and willing to break the law, willing to do uh, things that are immoral in order to get ahead. Should they? No. The Bible says they'll pierce themselves through with many sorrows. And as a minister of the gospel, gospel means good news, I want to warn you about that. I want good news to come upon you. I want you to have good, not bad. And it's a shame that people are so willing to do evil. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11. Ecclesiastes 8.11 says it well. Why do people want to do wrong? Why do people want to sin? Why do people want to do wicked and evil and ungodly things? Why do they want to prosper by doing that? Because they think they can get away with it. And you know, in some cases, they do. But let me say this, you won't get away with it forever. Okay? There is a reckoning coming where you will have to face judgment, either in this world or the next. And you will stand before a judge either a judge in a court down here or the judge in heaven. And you will be found guilty for your sin if you don't get it under the blood. Come to Jesus for forgiveness today. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11 says, Ecclesiastes 8, 11, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Because you can sin and do something bad and prosper from it, and you don't immediately go to jail. Sometimes you do get away with things that you do that are bad. You shouldn't, but sometimes you do. And because you get away with it the first time, you're like, well, maybe I can do this again. So you do it again, and you do it again. And, you, and it says here, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. People think, man, I can do evil and then get away with it. 
Well, you won't get away with it forever. And you shouldn't do evil. You should do righteousness and justice and goodness. Don't do bad. But today, many people are doing evil and getting away with it. And people are seeing that. People go, wow, look at them. They're doing wrong. They're getting away with it. Maybe, maybe if they can do that, I can do that too. Monkey see, monkey do type of thing. That's why we need to be good examples as Christians of what not to be and what to be. We shouldn't go do evil and abuse and, and use corruption and, and lie and, and take advantage of others in the sense that we're prospering off of them in an evil way. We shouldn't do that because other people are looking at us. We need to be the example of be right and do right and do good. And other people say, oh, okay, that's what I want to do. I want to be like you. But we're living in a day and age in a world in which many people are corrupt and wicked and ungodly. And they're doing wrong. And they think, well, I'm getting away with it. So they'll go even further into the rabbit hole and deeper into sin. But let me just say, they won't get away with it for long. Romans chapter 14 and verse 12 says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And boy, I'm glad I won't be in your shoes in that day where you have to give God an account of what you did and why you did it and try to justify your sin and try to tell God, Well, yeah, yeah, I know that was wrong, but, uh, but I, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, good luck with that. You ought to get it right today. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, And as it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Someday you will die, and someday you will give account to God for your sin. So who benefits from all the bad happening in the world today? Would you agree that there's a lot of evil in the world? Yes. Well, who benefits from that evil? Well, I know, Satan. Satan is behind it all. We looked at that in who's who's in charge, and who's to blame. We looked at how the devil is the god of this world, little g, behind the scenes. And the way that the devil works is the devil doesn't go around trying to help people, edifying. He goes around seeking to destroy. That has always been his modus operandi. The devil is always out there to try to destroy everything. And what he does is he goes out with his minions, and he has a lot of minions, and their little saying is, order out of chaos. We looked at that last time. So they want to bring chaos. They want to bring destruction. They want to bring uh, utter and complete confusion and, and, and suffering and, and economies being completely uh, devastated. And they want people in the streets rioting. Well, they want utter chaos everywhere. So that then they can come in and say, okay, we have the solution. Accept us and we'll fix it all. And what are they doing? They're setting up the Antichrist system in which now they'll say, now let's all worship the great architect, which we know is Lucifer or Satan, because the true great architect is God. But the, if you get into masonry and things like that, we've looked at that before. What is the uh, high levels of masonry? They go up to the 33rd degree, they say. Well, I heard they can go up to the 360th degree, because what is masonry? It's a compass and you put a compass down and you turn it around, there's 360 degrees. So I've heard there's 360 degrees in that. But when you get up to the 30th, 31st, 32nd, 33rd degree, they do the old switcheroo in masonry and they say, well, Lucifer is really Jesus and Jesus is really Lucifer. So Jesus is the bad guy and Lucifer is the good guy and we follow him, the light bearer. So you gotta be careful. And what do they say? Order out of chaos. So they're working for the devil to try to bring in the one world system of governing over the whole world which will eventually bring in the mark of the beast that's the goal okay so they're all working toward that now should we as Christians go along with that as a Christian I want nothing to do with Luciferianism or secret societies or anything like that we talked about that last time in who's in charge but I do see that there has been a system set up in this world in which the devil and his people benefit from the system and so I want to talk to you a little bit about that today in that system, that world system. Remember, the little G God of this world is Satan. And so he set the world up to where he gives it to whom he will. And people have to come and get that knowledge, you know, like masonry, the craft. Or people have to come and be indoctrinated in his way of doing things. And if they follow Satan, then Satan will let them prosper. You see, Satan pays very well if you sell your soul to him. The only problem is you lose your soul. But in this life, man, you can prosper if you go to Satan. But what about the next life? 
No prospering there. The only way to prosper in the next life is through Jesus. So please come to Jesus instead of Satan, and you'll be much happier in the long run, because all eternity is a long time. So I want to look at how Satan and his minions are in every sector of this world. And we see Satan in this world using different people and using different groups. And in each group, he allows them to prosper in evil ways. And these people begin to prosper as they serve Satan even more. I'm going to do my best to explain this because back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, the love of money is the root of all evil. As a young Christian who just got saved at age 18, I'd read that verse and I'm like, I don't understand how the love of money is the root of all evil. I don't get it. As I got older, I began to see all of this and I realized, yeah, the love of money is the root of all evil because people get into money and all they care about is money and they don't care about you. And all they think is, how can I get more money out of you? And they don't care if you suffer, if you lose your house, if you lose your car, if you lose your job, if you can't pay the bills, if you can't buy food to eat. They don't care if you're in the street homeless and, and on drugs and, and dying in the street. They do not care about you. All they care about is how do I prosper and get something from you. That is sad. Well, let me show you how the devil's system works. The devil is a banker. The devil wants money. He loves money. He sees that money is power, and power is money. And so the devil says, you know what I want? I want to get in control of the banking system of the world. And if you read Revelation chapter 13, ultimately, according to the Bible, that is how the devil takes over through the banking system of the world. Because when he takes over as the Antichrist, he calls it all, both great and small, you know, rich or poor, to take a mark in, not on, like new versions say, in their right hand or in their forehead, in which they can't buy or sell. Buy or sell, that has to do with banking. That has to do with money. So banking system, have you ever heard of the Rothschilds? There are what's called the Rothschilds. And the Rothschilds, and sometimes there's an S there, sometimes they leave the S out, but the Rothschilds were those that really helped set up the international banking system that we have in the world today. Years ago in the library here in Milton, Florida, I found a book about Rothschild and his five sons. And I've never been able to find that book again. Oh, that was the coolest book. It was about the Rothschild family, real thin, little tiny book, and about Rothschild and his five sons. And how Rothschild, and by the way, Rothschild comes from Red Shield in German. And the Rothschild symbol was a red shield with a red dragon. <laughs> You can't make this stuff up, folks. Guess what? A red dragon is Satan in the book of Revelation. And the Rothschilds were, uh, they say Jews. Now, I've always wondered, were they real Jews or were they that called themselves Jews that weren't? I, I, don't, I don't know. But um, the Rothschilds began the banking system. And they began to loan money out to the governments of the world. One son took Germany. One son took England. One son took France. One son, and the different sons went to different countries and set up the, the national banking system. And it got to the point where the countries were in debt, and they owed a debt to who? The bank. Well, do you know what the Bible teaches? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 22. The Bible teaches that the best way in the world to live is out of debt. Because when you owe a debt to someone, you're indebted to them. And that makes you, in a way, kind of a slave to them. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 7 says this, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. If you get a loan and you can't pay it back, then they've got the rule over you, right? You owe them everything you have. You're pretty much their slave. Being in debt is awful. My grandmother used to say this, If you don't have the money to buy what you want, then you don't need it. She always said, Buy with cash. There is a difference between cash and credit. And what is the difference? Well, it's best to pay for something in cash. Then it's over. You're done. Credit, oh, I'll pay you later. Now it's always this open-ended thing, and you're always worrying, well, do I get the money this month? Oh, can I? And it always leads to stress, which ultimately leads to you dying at an early age because you're under stress. Never get in debt. I don't like credit. I like cash. Cash is the best way. Credit He's just, there's nothing wrong with credit cards if you pay them off every month. 
But if you get in debt, you know what I'm talking about. It's stressful. Oh, do I have enough to pay this month? Oh, it's better to not be someone who's a servant to the lender. That's what I'm trying to say. It's best to do everything you can to stay out of debt. And yet the world doesn't want that. We hear talk today. They want to get rid of cash. They want to bring in credit. Why do they want everybody to have credit? Why do they want a chip or, or some sort of a, a digital tattoo, you know, like a QR code or something? Why do they want something like that in you in which your bank account is set to it? Because they want credit. And what they want to bring in is what they call the social credit score. And if they can bring in a social credit score like they have in China for every person, then they can rule over every person. Oh, well, we don't like what you said, so your credit score goes down. And now do you see how you're a slave to them and to the system? And so for many years, the bankers understood this, how they could take over the world through banking and credit and lending money. And then, oh, you can't pay back? Well, if you'll do this for me, we'll cancel your debt. And now they run countries and things like that. You ever heard of the Knights Templar and the banking system that they set up? You want to make money. You want to prosper. Get into banking. You ever heard of interest? In the Bible, it's called usury. U-S-U-R-Y. And God told Jews not to put usury on other Jews in the Bible. I think it was in Exodus I saw the verse. Now, if they were Gentiles, they could give them a loan and charge a little bit of interest. But nowadays, what are interests on credit cards? 20-something percent? That's criminal. Man, that's, wow. And uh, so bankers have all this money. Now, have you ever heard of uh, fractional reserve banking? All right, there's something you need to look up. Look up fractional reserve banking. And you'll get into something there, and you'll begin to understand how today it's all computer, it's all numbers. And the government has told banks, if you give a loan, you don't have to have that much in your bank. You can loan them the money even though you don't have enough to back it, and the government will back it. So it's almost to the point where bankers can't lose. The best thing in the world is become a banker and you'll be rich because you can't go out of business and you can't lose. What did they do when Obama was in office? Bailouts to the banks. The bank said, oh, we don't have enough money. Okay, we'll just give it to you. You go to the bank, you put your money in the bank, they give you very little interest on your money. And if you use their credit cards, you get a loan, they're charging you high interest. So they're getting you every which way from Sunday, getting your money. And then they, oh, boo-hoo, we don't have any money. The government goes, oh, here you go. Why'd they give it to those guys? Why did they give it to us who need it? <laughs> so this is a system that's set up that is pushing toward the system of the Antichrist in which he will set up his mark of the beast. So he will have his social credit score. And who benefits? Qui bono, the bankers always win because they're in bed with those in charge. Because if you look at the roster, oh, get this, check out this book, um, The Creature from Jekyll Island, uh, the guy that wrote World Without Cancer. What was his name? I'm drawing a blank. But look up World Without Cancer and look up The Creature from Jekyll Island. And you can see, I'll put his name up here if I find it later. And you can read these books and you can see how they've come as the banking system and they're able to make something out of nothing and then get your money by saying, we'll lend you this. And then they, they, they get authority over you. They get power over you. Now you're a, a person who's a slave to the banking system. And that's sad. But this is how the devil works. This is his system. That's why with all your power, you should do your best to stay out of debt. You need to stay debt free. That's the best way to live if you can. Learn how to save. Learn how to save and stay out of debt. Now, number two, all right, we look at the um, educational system of the world and we see people called professors or teachers. And professors oftentimes are evil. I don't know if you ever thought about it, but many of your professors that claim to be <clears throat> intellectuals, what do they say? We believe that communism is the best form of government, and uh, as an intellectual, I've read the books of Marx and Lenin and Stalin, and I believe that we need to put... And they're also muckety-muck high-ups. They try to make people think, look at me, I'm educated, I'm smart, so whatever I say goes, because you have to follow me. And many of those people are a bunch of windbags that don't even know what they're talking about. 
Modern colleges are not centers of higher learning in my estimation. Many of them are indoctrination centers of propaganda and of globalist CFR type of agendas. Many of your children today, they go off to colleges and they're not taught think with an open mind. They're taught believe what we say and it's like this. And they're taught evolution. They're taught there's no God. Okay, now there's no morals. Much of your college is all about partying and drinking and things like that, leaving God out of your life. When that's sad because you got to remember God. True learning is learning the Bible, learning the, the knowledge and wisdom of God. But they kick that out in these schools. They want you to learn the knowledge and the wisdom of man. They teach uh, communism. They teach the only God that exists is the state. So the state is God. So they make them little lackeys to the state and learning how to follow the state instead of following God. Now, the state wants to enslave you, but God wants to make you free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Many of your colleges today, they teach social justice, and they make a bunch of social justice warriors, and they tell them, go out and right all the wrongs in the world, and if you got to burn down stuff, go burn it down. And so they're out burning down things in the streets and things like, what is that? That's causing strife to destroy everything, order out of chaos. It's all working in tandem together to try to um, take over and try to manipulate people. Who prospers when there's chaos like that? The devil. He wants to overthrow society and existing governments, so the devil gets into these centers of so-called higher learning, and he tries to teach people, this is what I want, this is my kingdom, uh, work towards globalism and bring in a global one-world government in which I could be in charge. You know, teachers, many of these teachers, they get what they call tenure. And I don't understand this. What on earth, where did tenure come from? Tenure, if you're a teacher or a professor, means when you get tenure, you can never be fired from that university. You're above being fired. And many of these professors, they get into these colleges, they get tenure, then they start teaching the most outlandish, crazy, wicked, evil things, and then they can't fire them. And a lot of times what they're teaching destroys their students. And yet, I've got tenure. I can't be fired. What a strange thing. What is tenure? We don't see tenure in any other type of uh, industry. If a guy is evil, he ought to be fired. I don't believe in tenure. I think that's one of the worst things the world has ever seen. Look into that. Now, then we go to the medical industry and we look at doctors. Now, let me say, not all bankers are bad. Not all professors are bad, and not all doctors are bad, but there are many of them that are, and it's almost to the point that very few are still good, but there are some that are. But the way the devil set this up, it's easy to tempt these people into doing evil, and it's easy to get them to turn to the dark side because the system is set up in such a way that they're tempted to do wrong. When I was younger, my dad would always tell me about how he went to college to study to be a doctor. And then he told me, son, I, I just couldn't do it. And he said, son, what I did is I went to school studying medicine to be a doctor because I just wanted to help people. In my heart, I just wanted to help people. And he said, I learned by studying medicine that, number one, it was all based upon the false theory of evolution. And it was all, you're a cesspool of chemicals millions of years ago. Why chemicals on a rock went into a little pool of, of nothing. And that cesspool, all of a sudden, out came organisms. And so the thought of modern medicine is evolution. We're all a bunch of chemicals. So Dad said he saw what they did was just throw chemicals at everything. But you know, when you take man-made chemicals in a laboratory and you try to treat the human body, oftentimes that causes side effects. And oftentimes those chemicals... Uh, might fix something here, but they'll cause a side effect over here and make you sick. And Dad was taught, he told me that they taught him, or he saw this in, in his studying to be a doctor, that the pharmacy, Big Pharma, would come in and say, hey, you're studying to be a doctor. Um, we'd like to make an agreement with you that you sell our drugs. And we'll give you a percentage of every drug you sell from our company. Well, if you become a doctor... A lot of doctors I've met uh, say I can't sell certain drugs in, in good conscience from Big Pharma because I know they cause harmful effects on people. But other doctors with no conscience and no morals, they, oh, okay. And so they'll sell a drug to a person that really doesn't need it just to get that percentage.
from that company. Money. Love money is the root of all evil. Knowing in the back of their mind, you know, this is going to heal that, but it's probably going to make a side effect of this. And so when they come back and they say, hey, this is now fixed, but now the other thing is hurting, well, let me give you this drug too. Cha-ching, more money. And then they go away and they come back, well, doctor, those two things I had wrong, those pills helped, but now I'm having this problem. Oh, well, let me give you this drug. I've heard stories of people that are hooked on drugs by doctors, and they're literally taking 24, 25 pills a day. Do you know how many of those they need? Probably very few. Because the doctor is not fixing the cause of the problem. He's just fixing the symptom. And he's giving them drugs that give them more symptoms and more... My dad studied and he saw God is the creator and God in the Bible is the one who created all things. And my dad began to get into medicine that is natural. And my dad said, I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be a part of this system that, that tempts people to get in bed with the big pharma. And so dad said, I'm, I'm going to get into the natural medicine because oftentimes natural medicine doesn't have side effects. And so dad went ahead and dad got into natural medicine. Now he actually got into becoming a, 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 a weatherman and he was over here in Panama City. Um, he did the weather over there on TV for many years. So how you go from being a doctor to weatherman, I don't know. But after that, he went back to what he always wanted to do and dad went into natural medicine and he had a health food store here in Pensacola, Florida. And then that one closed and he opened another one. And I remember being four or five years old and going in there and seeing that health food store. And that's how Dad met um, people from the Bible school that I went to and learned things about that. And so it's an interesting story. But uh, do you know that pharmakia is the Greek word for sorcery over there in the book of Revelation? They repented not of their sorceries. That Greek word is pharmacia. That sounds a lot like pharmacy, doesn't it? <laughs> Big pharma is out there giving people stuff. Uh, there's a lot of concern in the world today. All these people running around shooting people with guns, you know, these crazies. Oh, school shooting, oh, how? The concern is, were they on big pharma drugs? Were they, they on some sort of prescribed prescription that had a side effect? You ever watch TV with these commercials? And they bring out this new Intivia. They show all these, you know, beautiful scenes like buy this drug, talk to your doctor. And they're riding a bicycle and they're all smiling and they're having a picnic. And you're like, oh, that's so sweet. Maybe I should try that drug. Then at the end of the commercial, side effects may include. And then it's depression, suicidal thoughts. And, it, and it's all and this huge list of side effects. Who wants those side effects? My thought is stay as far away from this kind of thing as you can and try to do as much as you can naturally to bring down your blood pressure using teas and different things and, and do everything you can, vitamins, supplements, minerals. I like to go that route because I see how easy it is for doctors to do what they do for money. And a lot of doctors do that. A lot of doctors are only about the money. And a lot of doctors, what they do is they do what they do just to get money. Now, there was a thing called the Hippocratic Oath. The Hippocratic Oath, um, my dad told me about, and, and how to become a doctor, you had to swear allegiance to the Hippocratic Oath. Now, there's the old Hippocratic Oath, and it's so long I won't read the whole thing. I'll let you look up the Hippocratic Oath. There's the classic Hippocratic Oath from Hippocrates, and it's all about how I will do the best to help my patient and, and not do any bad things, like I won't give them poison and things like that. Well, in 1960, they changed the Hippocratic Oath that a doctor is supposed to take. Did you know that a doctor, when he becomes a doctor, he's supposed to take the Hippocratic Oath? I think they've done away with that now. It was an oath that said, I will do my best for the patient and what's best for him, not best for me. It was to try to keep them moral. But they don't even do that now. And the oath was changed in 1964 by Louis, you're not going to believe this, you can't make this stuff up, by Louis Lasagna, that's his name, Lasagna, Lasagna. And he changed the Hippocratic Oath, and in the Hippocratic Oath, it says, this is scary, folks, this, this is scary to me, the power that a doctor has. Part of the new Hippocratic Oath, it says, I will respect the privacy of my patients, for their problems are not disclosed to me that the world may know. Most especially must I tread with care in matters of life and death. If it is given to me to save a life, all thanks. But it may also be within my power to take a life. This awesome responsibility must be faced with great humbleness and awareness of my own frailty. Above all, I must not play at God. 
What is that? When is there ever a time when a doctor is supposed to take someone's life? I don't know. I thought doctors were supposed to save lives. And there are a lot of doctors that do play God. If you get a chance, get this book by Robert Mendelson, Confessions of a Medical Heretic. A doctor who said, I saw such corruption and evil and wickedness within my uh, industry. It made me sick. Be careful. Be careful. Study about this. Learn about it yourself. Now, there's some more things. So do you see how the devil can get into the medical industry and, and turn it and change it and have doctors harming patients more than helping them? Now, I'm not telling you don't go to the doctor, okay? There are some good doctors out there, but I am telling you, be aware that the devil is behind everything and he can corrupt everything. And there indeed are some corrupt doctors out there, and you know it. Now, news media, let's look at this one. Journalists. Journalists. In the United States of America, we have the Constitution, and uh, I pretty much wonder if they're still going by it. At least we are. We who are Christians, we abide by it because we know that it was given to us by God. And when people become politicians, they're supposed to swear an oath to it. But the Constitution says we have the freedom of speech. And so in America, we have what's called journalism. Journalists are supposed to be free to make stories and write what they see and tell the truth. But today, we're looking at that and we're wondering if that's what's taking place. Journalism was supposed to be about integrity and honesty. Investigative journalism is investigating a story and then telling what you found, whether it's good or bad, whether people want it said or not. And it was said that the, um, the news media was the fourth branch of government because you had the presidency, you had the Congress, and you had the Supreme Court. And they all worked in tandem to make sure that not one of them had more power than they should. But what if someone got in power and used all three together? Well, then you were supposed to have the news media stand up and say, no, this is what they're doing. And be able to report on all the behind the, the back room deals and things like that in order to tell the people, hey, look, they're, they're, they're going against you. Um, when I was in high school, I took a journalism class. And boy, am I glad I did. It helped me. I had enrolled originally in typing class. And I was in typing class for two weeks. And I went to the principal and I said, I'm done. I'm done. I don't want this class. I said, there's another class open. Give me that other class because I cannot stay in this class. He said, what, what, what's wrong? And, and I'm glad I took that two weeks. It helped me to learn to type. And, and it was a little bit of practice. And I've been practicing ever since. And I can type pretty fast now. Something like 60, 70, 80 words a minute. I don't remember. But I can type real fast now because of that two weeks in that typing class. But our teacher was a pregnant woman, and she carried a ruler around. And she said, if you're not typing fast enough, you're going to know it, and I'm going to make sure you learn. So I'm typing along, and I'm not doing as good as I wanted to, and she comes over and, pow, hits me on my hands with the stick. I'm like, lady, what are you doing? And she was doing that to people in the class. She was hitting them. And I just said, nope, I'm not going to be in a class like this where I'm going to abuse. And I told my principal that. He said, oh, that's okay. He goes, all right, you can get into the journalism class. And so I did. And it was uh, taught by the assistant principal there. And uh, I'm so glad I took journalism class because journalism is all about who, what, when, where, why, and how, and which, the seven interrogatives. And every story that we wrote in a journalism class, it was like we were newspaper uh, article people, I mean uh, journalists, writing for a newspaper, he would grade them, and he would look for who, what, when, where, why, how, and which. And if he did not see those, then you got a bad grade. And I was used to going to newspapers and reading them, and as I read a story, I'm looking for who, what, when, where, why, and how. That is true journalism. Today, I get up every morning, read the Bible, and then I look at the news. And when I click on something and I try to read an article, folks, journalism is dead. They won't tell me who, they won't tell me where. Sometimes they'll tell you the what, but they don't tell you the when or the how. Or the, and it's just like people aren't taught true journalism anymore, and I can't get through an article without going, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen, and now I'm left with more questions. That I, they told me in journalism class, they said, when they read your article, they should know everything, and there should be no more questions because you wrote exactly what needs to be said about that. You gave the who, what, when, where, why, and how, and there's no questions. People were actually informed by your article. Not read the article and go, 
Well, no, I have more questions. What happened? Where? I mean, you go to the internet. Some guy died on the interstate someplace. You know, that's an article. And you're like, who? When? Where? What kind of vehicle was he in? What happened? Who was the other person? Was there was two people involved? I mean, and it, articles today, journalism's dead, folks. It's sad. And the journalists of today, I see it was all about supposed to being informed. They don't inform you of the truth. It's all supposed to be truth. No, today it's propaganda. Much of the journalists today are bought and paid for by who? Well, I don't know. There's some big guy out there named George Soros, and I hear that many of the news media people are paid by Soros. And it's crazy when you look at modern news. You, you can see the videos on YouTube where the story will come out one day, and every single journalist across the board in every state and on every news channel says the same exact words with the same exact phrases. It's scripted. Somebody in a dark room is writing it and says, now, all you say the same thing. And they do. That's not true journalism. True journalism is independent thought, independent people writing their articles. And everybody should be different. They shouldn't be the same. But now it's scripted. They're all saying the same thing. It's always one-sided, too. It's always against a certain group. And it's never always giving the same coverage to everyone. It's almost like World War II Nazi Germany, Joseph Goebbels and the propaganda ministry. That's what it seems like. It's kind of sad. Wish we could get back to true journalism in this country and around the world. Well, now you've got politicians. And in government, we are supposed to elect people. Now, there's a lot of questions. Are, are our votes even being counted? Uh, whatever. But politicians, they come in, they're supposed to swear an oath to the Constitution. And they're supposed to be working for us because our government is supposed to be we the people. So we elect somebody, we expect that somebody to have our best interests at heart and listen to us and do what we say. Do they do that though? A lot of times people become politicians and they get in there and rather than doing what their constituents ask them to do, they just stand around like this with their hand out and sure enough here comes a lobbyist or here comes somebody with some money and they say, now, this is what I want you to do. And a lot of politicians, now, not all politicians are bad. Not all journalists are bad, okay? Not all of these are bad. But the system is set up to be rigged for Satan so that Satan can benefit. And many politicians, they take bribes. Many politicians are stinking rich. And a lot of them, they get elected. And when they're elected, they're not worth a lot of money. And now they've been elected, and they've been in power 20, 30, 40 years. They're $100, $200 million is what they're worth. Where did all that money come from? That's not how much we, the people, pay them. They get a certain salary. It's not. Why is it they seem to profit off of inside deals? Stock trades, like they know something is coming, or they're passing a law to change this. And, oh, yeah, you know, we know this is, and others don't. So, hey, I'm going to buy this stock real quick, because that's going to... It seems like they're corrupt. It seems like they're doing evil things. It seems like they're doing inside trading. It seems like they're paid by lobbyists. It seems like they pass laws that help companies who later hire them to work for them. They're in as politicians. They have passed a law that helps certain companies, and then they're not elected again. Oh, darn. And then that company goes, well, come on over here and work for us as a CEO, and we'll pay you millions of dollars. Oh, okay. Why? Because they scratched their back. Now they're scratching it back. And folks, that's just how the world, the world works. It's evil, it's wicked, it's sinful, it's wrong, it's unlawful, but they get away with it. That's what's so sad. But again, they won't get away with it for long. Not much longer because Jesus will come back. Now look at this. Here's one that's really sad to me. Who benefits? All right? Qui bono? Well, we see that bankers benefit off of what they do. We see professors often benefit of what they do, doctors, journalists, politicians. A lot of times they benefit off of what they do, and yet they use their positions and abuse them for evil rather than good. And they get rich while others suffer. Do you realize there's people in religion who do the same thing? 
Do you realize in religion there are wicked people who claim to be religious people of God, but are only using their position of power in a church or a denomination in order to get rich? Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, the Bible says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. There's a lot of them out there, folks. And a lot of people in religion who are only in it for the money. They're like a bunch of wolves in sheep's clothing. And that's something I don't want to be. I've told people repeatedly, they don't call me religious, I'm saved. Because I see a difference between religion and salvation. And a lot of religious people are lost. Because they're preaching a works gospel. They're not preaching salvation through faith alone, in the blood alone, through Christ alone. So that's what I want to do. I want to be a good church leader. And I don't prosper. I don't make a lot of money. Okay, I'm not the richest guy in the world. I'm still suffering. Uh, we want to build a house because this little office is too small. <laughs> and I wish I had more lighting and better lighting. And I wish I could do better quality videos. There's so much that I'd like to do. But we do what we can with what we've got. And people tell me I'd rather have, you know, your preaching rather than doing it, you know, with a fancy this. And fancy. It's not about the fancinesses of it. It's about what you're saying and telling the truth. Well, that's what I want to do. But there's a lot of church leaders out there who are using their positions of authority over people in religion to get filthy, stinking rich. Let me show you some of those in the Bible. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 14. When Jesus showed up, he showed up to the people of Israel and he found that the priests were wicked and filthy and ungodly and all they cared about was getting rich. They wanted to prosper off the people. They were supposed to be ministers, ministering to the people, helping others. It was their job. But all they wanted to do was to help themselves and take from other people. And Jesus, boy, he gives them the what for in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. What are they doing? They're trying to take the house of a widow and then turn around and sell it and get the money. That's all they cared about was the money. And in the world today, we live in, unfortunately, there are a lot of so-called religious leaders claiming to be Christians, many of them. They're not saved. They don't know God. All they care about is prosperity. More! I want more! Give me more! i got to have more! You don't need it. What you need is Jesus. That's the most important thing. Matthew 23, 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Can you imagine extortion? That's mafia. Modern day churches that aren't preaching the right gospel, they are a modern day mafia, man. And they're out there trying to do extortion. And they did it back then, the priests of Israel. That's a shame that there are places like that today, how religion can prey upon people, P R E Y, and steal from them. You better be careful. Do you go to a church that preaches the true gospel, that tries to help you, or are they trying to get your money hmm, and take from you? But it says here in verse 26, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, and the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you liken unto the whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Outside, they put on this show, oh, I'm a good, godly Christian person, look at me. Inside, all they're thinking is, how can I get the money of these people so I can buy a new house and buy a new jet and buy a new Ferrari? And how can I get more from these people? I'm not like that. I never have been, and by God's grace, I don't want to be. I don't want to be someone that cares more about money than I care about others. So I want to stick with preaching the true gospel of salvation. Pray you pray for me. Now, last thing I want to say, as we talk about who benefits, there are a lot of people that benefit off of their positions, and oftentimes they abuse their positions, don't they? That's not something we should do. 
But is it wrong for us as Christians to benefit? No. No, there's nothing wrong with us getting some sort of benefit out of this world while we're here. Uh, the Bible says using the world but not abusing the world. There's nothing wrong with you benefiting. But what kind of thing do you want to benefit from? You see, what I've talked about today is physical. In the physical world, there's people that want to be benefited physically. But do you know what? There's a spiritual world. And what I want more in this world is the spiritual than the physical. Because however long I live in this world, that's how much long I have in this world. And it's a short time. 50, 60, 70, 80 years. And it's over. So, so what if I had a lot of money? What do I have over here? Because this is forever. How will I be benefited forever? Because here is just a short time. A lot of people, they don't see the long term. A lot of people are just thinking about the here and the now. And what can I do to get rich now? Well, you can have money for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years and die and have nothing. Where will you spend eternity, heaven or hell? Over here is heaven. And heaven is forever for those that are saved. And what we do here now is laying up treasures in heaven. So if you want to be benefited, if you want true prosperity, it's not down here. You know, you've got these charismatic maniacs, or charis what do they call charismatics, running around. Prosperity gospel, well, if you love Jesus and give to Jesus, well, he'll give to you. And he's, oh, he'll bless you. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Oh! It's not like that. We're under grace today. In the Old Testament, if you did right, you'd be blessed. If you did wrong, you weren't. Today, sometimes we do right and we suffer. Sometimes we do wrong, and we don't suffer. It's way different than in the Old Testament. There's no prosperity gospel today. Sometimes Christians suffer and don't prosper. That's part of life. Paul suffered. Peter suffered. I can't stand the prosperity gospel that's preached today. A lot of that is from these kind of people, the wolves. So what does the Bible teach? Well, the Bible says lay up your treasures in heaven. So you shouldn't be running around wanting prosperity down here you should be saying, how can I help people so that in heaven, I'll have riches in heaven? And that's where true prosperity is, is in heaven. Do you have any rewards in heaven? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm going to close here real soon. But I just want you to think about this. The devil wants you down here to prosper. And he wants you to do what he says, and he'll give you this, he'll give you that, he'll give you this. But then, will you have anything in eternity? You get it all here, you don't get it there. I'd rather have it all there than here, wouldn't you? Because eternity is forever. See, the problem with people in the world today is they think that this is the reality and that, oh, afterlife, that's just a fantasy. There's no life after death. The truth is, eternity is forever. And when you get into eternity, either in heaven or in hell, and you're there forever, you'll keep thinking, man, it almost feels like the time I was alive was a fantasy because it was so short. But this is the reality. And the reality is, without Jesus, you'll never prosper. It says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. True riches is only in Jesus Christ. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 4 through 8. Ephesians 2, 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by gra grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Wow. Wouldn't you want those exceeding riches? For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, and not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not works that saves us, it's faith. And many of your false religious leaders are out there telling you, you got to do this work, you got to do that work, and if you do this, you do that, you do this, well, God will give you this, and God will give you that. And they don't tell you about eternity, they only talk about the here and now. Folks, there is an eternity, and somewhere you will spend it. Eternity, somewhere. Where will you spend eternity? You ever thought about that? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And it says in Hebrews 11, 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. Who? God. 
For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Question, do you want rewards? Do you want treasures? Do you want pure happiness forever? That comes through Jesus Christ. And you need to come to Jesus for salvation. Because if you don't, you're not truly rich. You haven't truly benefited. You haven't truly prospered. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. This is written to a Christian. And if you're saved, guess what? You can have reward. Colossians 3, 23. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto man, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So there's a reward of inheritance. There's an inheritance you can get through Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and that there is no respect of persons. So God has no respect of persons. What does God think of these bankers and these professors and these doctors and these journalists and these politicians and these lost religious leaders? You think God's going, ooh, I'm impressed with them. Look why they have a degree. Ooh, look, they have money. You think God's impressed with that? Nah. God is impressed with those who come to him and don't have the love of money because the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, that doesn't mean you can't, as a Christian, have money. You can work and get ahead and get money, yes, but you shouldn't love that more than God. And you shouldn't use a position to make money by doing wrong. You should make money by doing right. I want to close with Psalms chapter 37. And Psalms chapter 37, verse 7 through 11. I want to read these. And in Psalms 37, 7, we read, And if you're one of these that's lost, and all you care about is prospering now by doing evil, I want you to pay heed to what this says. Psalms 37, 7, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of a man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. A lot of Christians are seeing the evil in the world. A lot of Christians are suffering. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I don't, what? And they're worried. The Bible says, don't worry about these evil people that are stealing from us. Don't worry about them. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Yeah, eventually. We go up to the rapture, we are saved. We come back with Jesus and rule with him for a thousand years. For yet a little while, and the wicked man shall not be. Yea, and thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. Verse 11, But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. <laughs> now, please take heed to what I said today. I'm not up here bashing doctors and professors and bankers and journalists and politicians. I'm not putting them down. I've told you there are some good bankers, there are some good professors, there are some, there are some good. But the way the system is set up, it is oh so easy for those that get into these positions to go the way of evil. And sadly, many of them have. And many of them are getting filthy, stinking rich. And we look at that, and we go, how did that happen? And in many cases, it's by their doing evil. Now we're in a mess. Now we're suffering. And it's because they broke the law. Because they cut corners. Because they did evil to get ahead. We're suffering. I hate that. I don't like that. I wish that never happened. And we see it. And we ask, qui bono? Who is benefiting from what they're doing? Maybe, just maybe, their policies are in favor of them and not us. Maybe they need to rethink the way they do certain things. Maybe they need to get right and do what's best for all of humanity, not what's best just for them. Will that ever happen? I seriously doubt it. I think it's going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. I think it's going to continue to get just awful because there will always be wicked, carnal, filthy, mean, hateful people that always want to prey upon others like wolves and steal from them. But only till Jesus comes. And so we pray for the day that Jesus comes at the rapture, and then we pray for the day when he comes back at Armageddon, and we get rid of all the bad guys. And now we benefit through Christ. We prosper in Jesus, who will then rule the world with a rod of iron. Well, thank you for watching. I appreciate you, and uh, hopefully this will end our um, series. Remember, number one was who's to blame, number two, who's in charge, and then this one, who benefits. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.